Hello and welcome back and today I want to return to the subject of SIM routers. These are routers that are powered with a SIM card inside delivering their internet connection and in today's video after amassing many many videos on this subject I want to tell you the 10 things that everyone forgets about SIM routers when they're about to buy one. Now you might get lucky and say well actually I knew that one fair play. Maybe you might know the odd one of these, but I don't think you've ever thought about them and really broken them down as much as I have. And in today's video, as I say, I'm going to go through all 10 and I strongly recommend you watch all of them. And there should be little timestamps in the description. So if you skip ahead, if you want to help you understand this whole subject and hopefully mean that when you buy your SIM router, do you get the right one first time? Let's go. This one is a real simple one, and one if you haven't had your finger on the pulse of network equipment over the last few years, it would have been really, really easy to miss. When you see SIM routers, whether you're getting one at the airport or knocking one out on Amazon that seems to be dirt cheap, some people overlook the fact about the frequencies it supports. Now, right now, most common household devices support 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz bands there. Now, it's really, really important because cheap um, SIM routers that you see on the market, a lot of them only support 2.4 gigahertz you get it with some ip cameras around the home it is the lower traffic density there a density a density and a lot of routers out there support both they are dual band 2.4 and uh, 5 gigahertz there. Now it's important because 2.4 gigahertz is a much smaller wavelength of a one-to-one -one connection. There's less data being transmitted. And the result is that even if you're using a new iPhone, Google um, Pixel, whatever you're using that support both of those frequencies, and this doesn't even bring into account Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6E, uh, you know, up to 5.9, and in the 6 gigahertz there, the result will be that even though your phone can handle faster data packets, most most cheap SIM routers can only communicate in 2.4 gigahertz. So make sure it is dual band or at least 5 gigahertz. Otherwise, you're already bottlenecking a tremendous amount of modern 5G SIM performance. And we touched on it there. 5G, 5G SIM routers are actually uh, 5G SIM routers are actually a lot more common these days. And you think, indeed, on this table, this side of the table has got a couple of 5G SIM routers there. But it's not as common as you think. And the majority of the time when you are looking online, and again, this goes to Amazon or any you know any kind of uh, e-shop out there that tends to list a whole gamut of different brands and manufacturers, whether it is because of uh, impending search patterns and different keyword tags, or just because of the brand being a little bit, shall we say, questionable about the way they portrayed their system, a system supporting a 5G SIM is not the same as a 5G SIM router. And you may get one not knowing Knowing that the 5G SIM you're putting inside that it seems to see and even in some places acknowledges is a 5G SIM router doesn't mean that the hardware architecture and the antennas that are put inside and the support of the cellular network means it can support 5G and at the end the result is you'll have a router that you even know isn't actually giving you 5G or worse that you've used a 5G SIM from like Virgin or O2 or you know the other brands you're not maybe not in the UK um, and you're not getting 5G so double check that it doesn't just say 5G SIM ready confirm that it supports a 5G SIM otherwise you will lose out on that performance and sometimes even if you're getting a 5G SIM and a 5G SIM router double check that you're going to be somewhere that has 5G coverage some people use 5G SIM routers for uh, you know uh, rented office spaces some people use them for portability when they come and go make sure if you're going for a 5G SIM router that it's worth doing it at all This next one is a big point when it comes to um, connected internet connections, and it really separates the pack when it comes to SIM routers overall. Because getting a router, the cheaper you buy one, the fewer or indeed complete absence you have of wired internet connections there, Ethernet or RJ45 connections there on the rear. That means that when you are using your SIM router in 5G or 4G, and you're getting all that lovely internet inside, 
you might not want to share it with a bunch of wireless things. You might want to patch it in directly. And cheaper SIM routers either have none or just one connection there. Whereas when you spend a little bit more money and you get more impressive routers, the ones that might cost 30 to 50 pounds more can often arrive with many ports there on the rear. And the same goes for when you look at the 5G department where you have ones here with both a WAN and a bunch of LANs, although you can get the 5G version, which only has the one. So double check the number of um, Ethernet ports on your system for your needs. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to scale up later on. And the same goes. Always check that they are gigabit Ethernet because one of the other ways in which SIM routers cut a little bit of money is they don't use 1G SIMs on there due to the architecture of the processor and the SOC inside the little uh, chip. The result is that sometimes it goes you've got two Ethernet ports but only one of them is 1GBE or gigabit Ethernet. So make sure you've got the right number of ports but moreover even if there's one port double check that you've got that connection and a lot of the time you'll know this from the spec sheets when they break it down when they say 1000 megabits that's 100 megabytes uh, per second there and also on top of that when it comes to utilizing ethernet ports on the base bear in mind one um, that if it is an intelligent router so a router such as the tp link mr 800 there or this dealing here or this one with its gui on screen double check that it has some form of graphical user interface because you're going to need that to configure those ports to assign things like port forwarding if you need to open ports like a normal router or link aggregation when you want to combine the ports there so do remember to check that out and otherwise most uh, intelligent routers and slightly more expensive ones they allow you if they have a graphical user interface as well to use tethering much like your mobile phone to use a usb port on the system to connect it to your PC or Mac or even your mobile and then get that full USB, in other words, if it's USB 3, 500 megabits per second, or if you're using um, a uh, USB 2 port there, still better speeds available without utilizing other LAN ports there. Now, this next point, I say it gets overlooked. This is one of these points that only people with experience of 5G routers end up finding out about. So this one is to save you money and not having to make the mistake that many of us have made. And it really applies to this one. This is the Netgear M1. They've upgraded it recently to a Wi-Fi 6 version, and it is a useful router, a uh, SIM router there. But do you know what isn't cool about it? which unfortunately is something a lot of Wi-Fi routers fall foul of, the power delivery. This um, d device here has an enormous battery. It's a little thinner, but it's giant compared to the over the internals of this machine. Now, a router is a lot more than like a mobile phone being used a lot of the time. It's actually a lot more constant, consistent, and harder working. Consequently, this battery gets depleted quick and you need um, the the lower quality of the battery or the poor design of the battery not I'm necessarily saying this has that because I'll get onto my main problem with this in a moment the, the result is you're going to have a router that runs down on battery, uh, battery a lot quicker or it's just incredibly inefficient internally because it doesn't want to tax the battery and it prioritizes the length of its lifespan over that of its actual utility now the reason I'm highlighting this battery in particular and for those of you that have ever looked at this online, before you buy it, I strongly recommend you read the reviews. If you have a battery that's a lot thinner, but a lot more widely spread, if it gets hot, it expands, and then it contracts, and then it expands, and then it contracts. And the result is, it starts to not match completely with the connector inside. And a lot of people use mobile routers on holiday in hot climates, in the bottom of bags, on planes with high pressure and more. And the result is that battery in that shape expands and contracts a lot more. And the result is you can have a battery that a little jiggle of the system disconnects the battery internally and the whole system needs to be rebooted. Now, if it's got auto reboot, who cares? But this requires you to hold the power button every time it powers off. So you end up with a router that you have to be very delicate with temperature wise, and it kind of defeats the object of a more portable router but it's not just that that's affected if you're running 
a, um, a SIM router, you need to know that the battery has got a sufficient power level and it has a sufficient power delivery system, such as USB Type-C and more, where the higher um, power delivery on charging is more consistent with its utility. And by that, what I mean is a router that, when it's operating, isn't going to use more power than the power delivery is giving it, because you end up with negative returns where you can have a router like this that not too long after its initial release will actually use more power than the USB can deliver inside. So remember, keep an eye on the batteries, look at the size of the battery in milliamps, but more importantly, try to find out the shape of the router and the battery together. Another one that a lot of people overlook, and I would argue one that it's understandable that you would overlook it, because a lot of the time you think what you're looking at is something different, and this is antennas. Now, if we look at this, the MR, um, uh, I think it's the um, MR600, if I remember the name correctly, my first SIM router I ever had in my first office, this router here has these big old antennas, which you would be forgiven for thinking are for connecting devices in your local area network. Same goes for this. You would think this is for devices to communicate with it, but they're not. These are just for the SIM card to pick up the 5 or 4G SIM data plan. These are for your mobile phone contract or your 30-day rolling SIM. In the case of this, exactly the same. But when you're connecting with the device, that's annoying. When you're connecting with the device um, on, the, on the LAN in your local area network with the devices, other mobile phones, it connects with the system using many, many internal antennas that are wired around the internal of the chassis and kind of tucked into the sides. This one, I believe, has six small antennas strategically placed around the system, and those antennas are for the connected devices. So don't assume that a router that has giant antennas is going to have amazing coverage in your home. It one, those antennas are for picking up the 4G signal, not for distributing the connection. And another valid point, we can then look at routers like these, which have got routers for both the 4G connection and the internal network very close together and can cause conflicts there. Now, both of them arrive with the facility to add more antennas inside. If you look inside or remove rubber plates, you see there's the ability to add external antennas there. They both have that facility because they are well aware that the close confines of all antennas can result in conflicted signals and a busier um, wireless network than you might ideally like. Now this next one kind of harks back to something I said earlier on in a slightly different manner. Go for a router with some kind of graphical user interface. And by that I mean either a router that arrives with a screen that you can manipulate and select options and scroll through in order to configure the device, or one that, much like a traditional router, you can log in on 192.168.0.1 or 1.0 or whatever, basically root. So you can access a graphical user interface and manage the router. There are so many reasons for that with regard to setting up the SSIDs or a guest account or whatever. But more importantly than anything, it is to give you the ability for priority of service, POS, or even QOS, quality of service. But with the priority of service, chances are when you're using a Wi-Fi router, maybe on day one, you're only using it with your laptop or your phone. But over time, you are going to use it with more devices, friends, family, colleagues, more devices that you carry. And when you do that, the router, because a SIM router connection is by no means as fierce or consistent as a wired internet connection, it becomes even more important that your router knows which devices are the most important. So what you don't want is using a fluid 5G internet connection with your laptop while you're uploading a video to YouTube or editing stuff on the fly, maybe even streaming or contacting or doing a Zoom meeting, the last thing you want is your mobile on the other side of the room suddenly deciding to update, suddenly deciding to connect some different applications. And ultimately, with each device having no priority of service, it becomes like the Wild West on your internet connection. So make sure you go for a router with a graphical user interface, either onboard or via a web browser, because then you can make sure the devices that are the most important 
are king of the pile when it comes to when the internet arrives. This next one is a little niche, I'll give it to you, but one of the main popular reasons that um, 4G SIM and 5G SIM routers has, has grown in the business sector these days isn't because people use them as their primary internet connection, but they use them as a failover. Now, I talked about this in my Synology router video and others, but routes, a lot of routers have um, failover capabilities. Now, think of your ISP router, not a lot of them have it, but a lot of paid premium routers from companies like Netflix, um, D-Link, TP-Link, all those sort of brands, they give you the ability to not only have a wired internet connection that's coming in from your ADSL line from the wall from your internet service provider, but you can also connect a 4G router to one of the available USB or uh, one of the available LAN ports on your normal bog standard desktop router. Now the reason you do that because your business likely runs on data and if your wired in connect internet connection goes down due to service interruptions, a breakage in line or engineering works from your internet service provider, a lot of those companies that can't afford to drop the internet connection then have a backup internet connection on a 4G SIM that just sits there that costs them 10, 20 quid a month as an insurance policy and therefore they don't lose internet connectivity. Why am I bringing this up as a question when what I've said is a statement? Well, quite a lot of routers uh, mobile SIM routers do not support failover. Now, what that means is, although the router you have in your home or office that was from your internet service provider or you bought from Netgear does have failover support, if you connect some of these routers, such as these two, they don't have the failover switch to push it there. So they are delivering the internet connection, but they don't understand the concept of failover with regards to the client and they're not built to be uh, uh, to the host they're not designed to be client devices they're designed to be host so you might buy a mobile sim router that doesn't have failover support in both directions they of themselves such as this one which does have failover support because it has both a sim slot and a wan slot there same goes for the tp link but if you utilize these two as failovers for your existing internet connection, it wouldn't work. So make sure you go for SIM routers that support failover in both directions. This next one is a, probably of all the things I'm talking about the most obvious, but you'd be amazed how often people still make this error. Getting a 5G SIM and a Wi-Fi 6 connection in a router, I would say in 2022 for a mobile SIM router, is essential. Right now, as 5G gets spanned more and more out around network environments around the world, uh, internet environments around the world, the true speed when you're close enough to a 5G mast is good enough that if you aren't running a Wi-Fi 6 router, which can divvy out connections a lot better, but also maximize the full potential connection, you're missing out. So if you are looking at a router and you're already looking at a 5G SIM router, spend a little bit more and get a combination Wi-Fi 6 and 5G router like this one, the DWA. We've done a review on this. It's a 5G Wi-Fi 6 router and it allows you to have little or no limitation on that bandwidth as 5G connections get more um, ad, uh, available around the world, but also more devices arrive with Wi-Fi 6 as well. And it's getting better and better. And again, thanks to uh, prioritizations of the five gigahertz band across devices, Wi-Fi 6 and 5G routers are becoming even faster in terms of direct bandwidth connectivity. And again, once you factor in the LAN connections, once you factor in USB tethering, it just gets better and better. This next one comes back to that idea of having a graphical user interface because it's another thing that people seemingly overlook. And the worst thing is, if you are hearing this point, I feel there's some of you that are going to feel this pain immediately because it happened to you. And that is roaming. So, so many people buy a SIM router and not enable room roaming until it's too late. Or they do enable roaming and they shouldn't have. For those that aren't aware, and I'm sure you are, roaming is when you are outside of your uh, traditional base country or zone and you're moving into another area where 
your cellular coverage is being handled by a third party. And that third party may have its own rules on how much per text, how much per call, and of course, how much per gigabyte of data or even megabyte in most cases. Now, if you are worried about the price when you're moving out and you're using a mobile SIM router like these two, then chances are you need to disable roaming. But the key point is the ability to do it. If, like myself, because I fell foul of this a couple of years ago, when I was using a mobile SIM router, you go to another country, uh, such as Germany, where still within the EU, which has even now um, Brexit and stuff like that has happened. If you are a UK traveller, you can still use your allowances in a lot of EU countries. When you go over there, you still require roaming to be enabled to be able to use your data plan. Now, why am I saying all this? Because if you're not using a device that has a graphical user interface that allows you to scroll along and enable uh, roaming, which is something this does allow you to do, the result is you'll go to the other country and you won't be able to enable your internet. But worse still, you can't access the internet to try and enable roaming because you can go and visit the login page for your local uh, cellular provider, you know, O2, um, anyone, Orange, etc. Orange doesn't exist anymore, what am I saying, Virgin? Um, but on top of that, if you have roaming enabled and you're not able to disable it, it might cost you real money. So make sure you either go for a router that has the ability to go through its own on-screen user interface to enable or disable roaming to your needs, or has an online portal, or at least a graphical user interface via a browser that allows you to toggle that setting. Because if you don't do it before you use it in another country, my God, it will annoy you. This last one, again, kind of irks to something I mentioned earlier, but is a completely different direction overall, and that is power saving mode. You would be amazed how many routers do not have a power saving mode when it comes to 5G routers at least. You would think it would be commonplace. And yes, you'd almost understand for mains powered routers like these not to bother having them. But particularly devices that have internal batteries, the fact some of them don't have either automated or configurable power saving modes built in is staggering. And the worst thing is when you are connected to a router, Think about when you've used your mobile as a hotspot without connecting it with a cable and how how quickly your battery depletes. Now imagine it's a dedicated router with all of the features and facilities of a router that's this big running off of a battery. Not only does having just an active connection without really using it start to consume that power, but as more devices come along with idle pings and more and services on your mobile that you may not be accessing live, but at least in the background of using data, not having a power saving mode on a 5G or 4G SIM router can be detrimental in the extreme. And that goes back to the idea of expanding batteries and more. So make sure either there's an automated or a, um, um, a configurable battery saving mode on your 5G SIM router. But this has been 10 things that lots of people or indeed everyone forget when going for their first SIM router. I hope you found this helpful. I know it's run a bit long, but it's an important subject that I've covered a lot over the years, and I think a lot of these tips should be handed out. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed it, click like. If you want to learn more, click subscribe. Use the free advice section and the links in the description to lots of articles I've discussed on this topic. And other than that, I will see you next time.